This video is part of a series where we build an entire FPV drone from start to finish. So if it feels like you're in the middle of a conversation that you missed the start of, that's why. If you're here for the information in this specific video, keep watching. But if you want to find out the full context for what's going on here, there's a link in the video description to the full playlist, and you might need to go back and start with video number one. People who fly HC0 were probably really disappointed to find out that HC0 was not originally included in my beginner build series. And uh, the reason for that is that, in my opinion, unless you're flying racing at relatively close range, you really need the one watt output power of the HD0 freestyle video transmitter. But the HD0 freestyle video transmitter just doesn't fit well inside the QAVS frame. Yes, technically it will fit but it barely fits and it overhangs the edges and we just felt like it wasn't something we would feel good recommending. But today all that has changed because HD0 has released the Freestyle V2, which is a freestyle video transmitter with the full one watt of output power in a form factor that is very similar to like a Cadex Vista and it totally will fit inside the QAVS V2. So I am immediately updating the series to include this and I'm happy to be able to do that for the folks who fly HD0 as their primary system. And this is really exciting because the HD0 one watt video transmitter, it's the best HD0 video transmitter you can get as long as your frame can hold it. And a lot more frames are gonna be able to hold it with this new form factor. So let's get through the install and the setup, and then you can continue with your build of this quadcopter. I have purchased the HD0 Freestyle V2 in a kit with the Runcam 90fps camera. And that's what I'm going to suggest you do too, unless you just happen to have an HD0 camera laying around that you prefer to use. The HD0 90fps camera is the best camera you can get today for the HD0 system, in part because it supports the uh, 540p 90 ultra low latency mode. And if you like it and you want to try it out, you can. If you don't like it, it supports all the other modes that HD0 supports. Um, I just think it's the one to get. If you do get the camera in a kit, it's going to come pre-connected to the video transmitter, which you would think would make installation easier. But it's actually going to make our installation a little harder because I'm going to take these screws out and take this retaining bar off. I want to run the cable underneath my ESC and uh, I don't want to disassemble my whole freaking flight stack to do that. So I'm going to go ahead and take these screws out and remove this little bar here. Great. And then we can pop this MIPI connector off just by pressing up gently against the outer bar. Once I've removed that, I'm going to run that cable up underneath my ESC here. It's going to be difficult for me to show you that on camera, so you just have to take my word for it. Once that's done, the cable will come out the back and we can reconnect it to the video transmitter. Just line it up and press down on it and it should snap into place with minimal force. If it seems like it's requiring too much force to snap it down, it's probably misaligned and you'll just need to sort of feel that out and figure that out. I do want to acknowledge that my quadcopter is in a little bit of a different state than yours is probably in. I have actually completely finished this build and finished this video series. And uh, now I've come back to record the video transmitter section, but hopefully none of that will be too disruptive to your ability to follow along. Definitely don't skip this retaining bar. You definitely want this retaining bar to hold that camera cable in place. Next, we're going to take this cable that comes with the video transmitter, and good news, it is a completely solder-free install. Thank you, HD0. One end of the cable has a little retaining clip, and that end will plug into the HD0 video transmitter, and the other end will plug into the DJI plug on the flight controller. Hey there, folks. It's Joshua from the future. I'm sorry to say I have discovered a problem with this cable that means that installing it uh, to the flight controller is not going to be as simple as I had hoped. The problem is that the order of the wires is backwards. If you look closely here, you'll see that we have red, black, yellow, white coming from left to right. And the way the flight controller is wired is actually red, black, yellow, white coming from right to left. The reason for this is that there didn't used to be a standard for 
DJI plugs on flight controllers. The wires that were in there were standardized, but the left to right versus right to left order was not standardized. With the DJI 03, everyone has standardized on the order of the wires that the DJI 03 uses. I have notified HD0 of this and perhaps they will fix it in the future. So what I want you to do is I want you to plug this plug in and I want you to see if your wires look like mine, we have some work to do. And one option would just be to cut the end of the wires off and solder them to the flight controller. And if you feel like doing that after you see the way that I'm gonna do it, then what you're gonna wanna do is go look at the walk snail video in this playlist series and solder this video transmitter to the flight controller exactly like I soldered the walk snail one, okay? But I'm gonna do this a more annoying way, but a better way, and I'm gonna repin this plug. The reason this is super annoying is just that it, you know what, here's a, here be a great way to do this. Ah, there we go. This stuff is called blue tack, and it's just a sort of a tacky blue sticky substance and I'm just gonna stick that down and I'm gonna stick this to it to make it easier to work with. Oh yeah, that's nice. And then what I'm gonna need to do is I'm gonna take like a very thin knife or utility knife or something and I'm gonna very carefully lift each of these pins and after lifting the pin very carefully slide the wire out. There we go, I got it. There we go. So one problem you run into is that if you are pulling on the pin then it sort of locks into the little retention tab and that you can't lift the tab. Not the end of the world, but I definitely like to avoid doing this when I can. Now, before I remove the last wire, I'm going to put the start putting the wires back in. In fact, I may not... No, I do need to remove that wire, but I want to make sure I get the wires back in correctly and not put them back in accidentally the same way I did. So I'm just going to know that I've been working from left to right, one, two, three. And here's my last wire. I'm going to reinstall the wires back in the plug. I want you to take a very close look at this, the sort of anatomy of this plug. And what I want you to see is that the plug has kind of a U shape to it. It's a little, it's so small, it's difficult to pick it up on camera. It's kind of got a U shape. And then on the back of the U, there is a little tab, a little tooth that is used to retain the tab uh, in the in the plug. What we're going to do is we're going to take the side of the plug that has the retention tabs and we're going to insert the U facing down away from that. We're going to need to look at it and turn it so it goes in the right way around. And once it's fully inserted, you can then just give it a little tug to see if it comes back out again and it should not come back out again. It should have been fully sort of retained. Now that we've got that red one in and we know what we're working with, we can go ahead and pull the last white wire out. And it goes red, black, yellow, white. So for this yellow wire, I keep pushing it in and it's just not biting. It still just pulls right back out again. What you can do is you can push the wire all the way in and kind of press down on the retention tab to see if it'll bite. Have I got it in upside down? I do not. All the way in and there we go. So now the retention tab is biting and it's secured. There we go. Now all four wires are in the correct order. Let's find out. It's going to be really sad if I fried this VTX by powering it backwards by trusting the pin out from the factory. Yay! It's lighting up. It seems like it's working. Okay, I'm with the video. I like to have as few cables as I can running over the top of the flight controller because it, uh, the battery straps can sometimes interact with them and tug on them and stuff, and it just keeps things neater. It's gonna go like this, and it's gonna come out the side like that and plug into the flight controller, and I'm just gonna give it some twists to take up some of the slack, and we'll plug it into the flight controller. Good. We'll just kind of tuck that wire under there so it's nice and out of the way and put the flight controller back on. We'll just take a look and make sure that none of those wires are crimped or pinched or anything like that. Next, we're gonna prepare the antenna for mounting and I'm gonna be using this 3D printed antenna mount. I've got a link to this 3D printed mount in the video description below. You can print it yourself or you can buy a print from Noozle 3D. This is actually a Caddx Vista mount uh, and we're gonna have to modify it slightly to make it work with this antenna. You could, of course, just use an SMA antenna mount and use any aftermarket 
right-hand polarized SMA antenna. There's various ways to go about it, but we'll go ahead and use the antenna that came with the kit just for simplicity's sake. I do want to acknowledge that this 3D print looks like shit. Uh, I think my filament must be wet. Uh, my printer is capable of much better. I am capable of much better, uh, but I am not interested in waiting another, whatever, half hour to reprint this in order to get the video made. So we're just going to go ahead with the shitty looking. Well, the first thing you need to know about this antenna mount is that you're going to have to manually slice down this seam here to open it up. Uh, when you do that and put the antenna on the inside, the next thing you'll see is that it's kind of loose in there. I think that the Cadix Vista is just slightly larger in diameter. So I'm just going to take some electrical tape and I'm just going to build up a layer of electrical tape around this antenna to bulk it out a little bit. And when I have done that, hopefully this will be a lot more snug. Yes, it is. It's a lot more snug. Then we can take a zip tie and zip tie around it to put some tension on it. But we'll go ahead and wait to do that until we are closer to the end of the install. The antenna is going to connect here on the video transmitter. The said connector is called a UFL connector. And you just kind of got to line it up. And when you'll, you'll kind of feel it slot into place. And then you can just apply some downward pressure to pop it into place. Just kind of wiggle it around until you feel it go. When it is in place, it will wiggle side to side like this, no problem, but it should be secure and not want to kind of lift off. Uh, as you're manipulating the UFL connector, please do not damage the cable. Make sure you're manipulating the brass connector itself and not the cable, as the cable can be damaged, can get ripped out, and that, of course, would be bad. Then you're going to take this plastic retaining bar and we're going to slide it into place here, and there are two screws that the unit comes with that will hold it in place. Once that's done, we'll mount the video transmitter and we are gonna go ahead and take this piece of double-sided tape. We'll pull the sticky paper off. We're gonna put the antenna side down. I don't think you have to do it that way, but that's the way that makes the most sense to me. And we'll go ahead and stick that on. It's, I find it kind of hard to pull the uh, backing of VHB tape off without using a tool. Lift it, I can just peel it. And we're gonna turn that over. Don't touch the VHB tape. Uh, if you can avoid it, the oil from your fingers will make it less sticky. And we're just gonna, I think, push this a little bit far forward. We don't wanna have any contact here. Definitely don't want any contact with the standoffs. So I'm just gonna push it forward just a little bit to give myself a little room in the rear. And what you do is you'll press it down and just give it a wiggle and that wiggle kind of locks that tape in and then it's probably not going anywhere. Next, we're going to mount the antenna and I'm just going to give that kind of a loop around to take up the slack. We don't want to just have the loop hanging out the side because then it could get damaged by the props. We also don't want to kink the uh, cable either though. So just give it a nice loop and then we're going to press the mount over the standoff. Jeez, that TPU looks like crap. That is a terrible print. I am embarrassed to show that to you. Just take a zip tie here, maybe two zip ties, and just really clamp that down so it stays in place. I'm not sure whether you have mounted your receiver yet or where in the tutorial I show you how to mount your receiver, but since uh, we're sort of doing this after the fact, I'm going to go ahead and mount the receiver. And I'm not convinced... I love the idea of mounting the receiver on top of the VTX, which is what I would normally do. Reason being that there doesn't seem to be a lot of room on top of the VTX. If I had to run a battery strap through here, there just wouldn't be much room. I could take the receiver and kind of mount it sideways and make room for a battery strap here. But I think what I'm actually going to do is just push it down behind the video transmitter and tuck it in there. And I think that's going to be fine. I could even get some double-sided tape and stick it in there if I really wanted to be secure. Next, we're going to mount the camera. And in order to do that, we're going to need to install this silicone spacer because the JBQ AVS requires a 19 millimeter camera, but this is a 14 millimeter camera. And having done that, it should slide into the front end just fine. The kit does come with some mounting screws for the camera. The QAVS also includes mounting screws for the camera. We're going to just try to find a set of screws that look like the right size. And I think these guys are going to be correct. 
Um, we want screws that are long enough to fully engage with the camera, but not so long that they uh, dig into the camera and maybe damage the electronics. And then the other thing I need to think about is where I'm going to mount the camera on these side plates. Uh, my side plates are already installed on my frame because this is, uh, I'm retroactively making this video after having finished the build. Yours may not be. So I want the camera far enough forward that it doesn't see any of the standoff, but far enough back that it doesn't protrude out and get damaged. I think that this very frontmost mounting hole is actually going to be the one that works best for us. So unfortunately, I have had to dip into my supply of screws. The length that worked the best for me it appears to be six millimeters, six millimeter M2 screw. Uh, I'm going to hope that the QAVS frame included a screw that is close enough to that length that it will work for you. I know it comes with several, but since I have finished the build, I don't have the frame kit right here to uh, pull it out and confirm that for you. Sorry about that. I know that's probably disappointing. That looks really good. I fear that because I am not sort of in the groove of recording the beginner build tutorials, that there are things that I'm leaving out and not telling you because I don't remember them. So as much as uh, I, I hate to say this, I'm going to suggest that you go watch the installation instruction for one of the other cameras. Like, just go watch the analog camera installation video in this playlist. You don't need to watch the part of the video related to the video transmitter, but just watch the part where I'm installing the camera in the front of the quad to see if there are any important tips or steps that I left out. We're going to call this good. We've got the hardware mounted, and we're going to go ahead over to the computer and finish the setup. The first thing we need to do over here at the computer is unlock the video transmitter and update the firmware on it. And yeah, it ships with the latest firmware at the time that it's manufactured, but the unlocking everybody's going to want to do because it ships locked to 200 milliwatts of output power for re regulatory reasons. But assuming you have a ham license, which you totally do, you're going to want to unlock it to get that full one watt of output power that you paid for. And it turns out that after you unlock it, you have to reflash the firmware to it because, because that's just the order of in which you have to do things. So here's what we got to do. So we're going to go here to the HD zero website. I'll put a link to this down in the video description. And the first thing we're going to need to do is unlock the video transmitter. And we're going to do that by flashing the unlock freestyle firmware. This is a special firmware whose only purpose is to unlock it and enable the full output power. That zip file will contain a single file named hd0tx.bin. This is the file that we're going to flash to the video transmitter. The simplest way to update the firmware on your HD0 video transmitter is using this HD0 VTX programmer. Uh, this uses a piece of software that runs on your computer and just plug the video transmitter into this USB device and flash the firmware to it. I do not have this programmer and I'm going to guess that you don't either. If you don't, you should buy one. In fact, I'm going to buy one right now. But since we don't have it, we're going to update them the old fashioned way, which is a little bit clunky but uh, we'll get the job done. And the old fashioned clunky way to update firmware is to plug the video transmitter into the firmware update port on your goggles. Whether you have the HD0 goggles like I do or a different, even the standalone HD0 video receiver, they all have a firmware update port and they all have an SD card slot. And that's how we're gonna update the firmware. So I'm gonna take this SD card out of the goggles. You're gonna want an SD card that you have formatted inside the goggles so that you know it can be read by the goggles and is formatted correctly. We're gonna take that SD card and we're gonna put the hd0tx.bin file on the root folder of that SD card, basically the first folder that pops up when you insert the SD card. Then we're gonna put the SD card back in our goggles and power up the goggles. Next, we're gonna take this cable, which comes with the, didn't come with the video transmitter. I guess it must come with the goggles. I can't remember where I got it. I don't think you should have to buy it because I'm pretty sure HD0 provides it for you. But if you don't have it, you might need to buy one, which point you should just buy the programming adapter anyway. Anyway, I have this cable and I don't remember how I got it. Uh, and this cable, <laughs> I'm laughing, but it's gonna be really painful for you if you don't have one. I'm, you, you must have one. Uh, we're gonna plug that into the goggles. 
like so in the firmware port. And we are gonna need this little adapter, which adapts the goggles to this little small plug, which is the plug that's on the video transmitter. On the video transmitter, this is the plug that we're gonna be plugging into. When I plug in, you should see the power light on the video transmitter power up. That's a good sign. And then in the menu in the goggles, we're gonna go down to firmware. We're gonna highlight update VTX and click. And it actually happens really quickly, flashing success. Now don't unplug that cable yet because we're not done here. The next thing we need to do in order to finish unlocking the video transmitter is power it up. We have flashed a special firmware to the video transmitter that when the video transmitter powers up, it will unlock itself. So I'm gonna grab this battery and I'm gonna plug it, wait a second, wait a second. Have you done a smoke check? Have you powered your quadcopter up yet? I think you have, but it's been a while since I originally recorded this series and I'm not sure. If you haven't done a smoke check yet, no, you must have done a smoke check because otherwise, how would you be setting up your video transmitter? Okay, I'm gonna plug in and I'm gonna assume you've plugged in before too and it's safe for you to plug in and you're not gonna fry anything. We're gonna plug in. I don't know how long you wait. Wait 30 seconds, wait a minute, wait a little while then power off the video transmitter. After we've unlocked the video transmitter, we then need to flash the actual working firmware back to the video transmitter. And the way that you're gonna do that is go to this page on the HD0 website and download. Well, I can't show you the firmware to download because it hasn't been released yet at the time that I'm recording this. But at, at the time that you are watching this, there will be a new firmware above this one, dated whatever date it released, and it will say release notes, add support for Freestyle V2. And when you download it, there'll be a bunch of folders in there and one of them will be Freestyle VTX V2. I don't think it's gonna be the Freestyle VTX because I think they're gonna have separate firmware for the V1 and V2. I'm not 100% sure about that. And then you'll go into that folder and there will be, aha, an hd0tx.bin file, and that's what you're gonna flash. But in my case, I've got a special zip file given to me by hd0 that contains the pre-release firmware, and that's what I'm gonna use, hd0tx.bin. They're all named hd0tx.bin. And my goggle battery is too low and gonna die. Let's get this done quickly. So I put the SD card in the computer and here is hd0tx.bin. That's the old unlock firmware. We're gonna delete that off the SD card, and we're going to copy over the new hd0tx.bin, which is the actual working for It would be really helpful if they would rename these to something descriptive. They're all just named hd0tx.bin, and you just have to know what they are based on what folder they're in. Oh well. We're gonna put that SD card back in the goggles, and once again, we're gonna scroll down to firmware and update VTX. Now, we should have a fully unlocked and fully working video transmitter. Let's go ahead and unplug the cable. We will plug in, and what you're gonna see is, uh, you should see three beat, three blinks of the blue LED when you plug in if it has successfully been unlocked. I wasn't counting. One, two, three. I did see, I saw three beings. One, two, three, it was really fast. And what we should see is we should see a freaking image from the camera. Scan now. Come on, baby. Oh, yes, race one, boom, and oh boy, I installed my camera upside down. Isn't that nice? The next thing we need to do is set up the flight controller to talk to the video transmitter so that the video transmitter can display on-screen display OSD information in the goggles. A simple way of understanding why the OSD is so important is it, if you didn't have an OSD, it'd be like driving your car without a gas gauge. You would just suddenly run out of gas and be stranded in the middle of nowhere and not know that it was coming. The on-screen display can display all sorts of information about the quadcopter. One of the most essential ones it displays is your battery voltage, and that tells you when your battery is about to die and when you need to come in and land. There's a whole bunch of other useful information that the OSD can show you while you're flying. You definitely want this working. Before I sat down to record this part of the video, I went back and rewatched this older video from when I originally recorded the build series because I finished this build. I'm going back to do the HD0 video transmitter. I kind of don't remember exactly where you're at in this sequence, what your quadcopter is like, what kind of things you do and don't know or have or haven't done. And as much as I hate to do this, I know it's gonna feel bad for me to say, I want you to go watch the tutorial for a different video transmitter. 
uh, instead of me just remaking a brand new tutorial just for the HD Zero folks. I don't want you to feel like second class citizens. I'm worried that that's going to happen. But I also know that if I try and sit down right now and make this up from scratch, I'm not going to give you as good information as well tailored to where you are right now in the build as if I do that. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to suggest that you go to this, I'll put a link in the video description. You're gonna to go to the walk snail video transmitter and I'm gonna, not, not the soldering, none of that stuff, cause you've already installed your video transmitter, not the update firmware, not the binding. We're gonna start right here with set up the OSD in Betaflight. I want you to pause this video and I want you to go watch that video so you can see all of the background information that I'm talking about that does pertain to you and then come back here and I'm gonna show you the specific steps you need to follow to get your HD0 video transmitter working. Hey, if HD0 had released the V2 Freestyle three months ago, I would have done this video as part of the original series, but we are where we are. So you're gonna watch from here, set up the on-screen display. You can skip, move the walk snail OSD position, configure Betaflight canvas size, yes, load my OSD preset, yes. You're gonna watch all the way through that and then Everything else in the video, you don't need to really worry about. Now that you've got all that background information, here are the specific steps I want you to follow in order to get your HD0 video transmitter working. And the first thing we need to do is identify the UART number that the video transmitter is wired to. We're gonna do that by downloading the manual. You don't have to, I've got it here, but I wanna show you the process just so you see how it goes. We're gonna go and we're gonna find, this is the plug right here that our video transmitter is plugged into. And we can see that it goes 10 volts, ground, TX3, RX3. TX3 and RX3 mean that the video transmitter is connected to UART number three, and that's information we need. Next, we're gonna to go to the Betaflight Presets tab, and we are going to search for HD0. And we're gonna choose these options. Unlocked Freestyle, set up HDOSD, map to display port, and the port is gonna be UART3. We're gonna choose those options and pick, agree, and save and reboot. Next, we need to set the canvas size correctly. Uh, some video transmitters will do this automatically, but in my experience, they don't all do it, and I always do it manually just to be sure. For HD0, the correct canvas size is as shown here. You can go to this URL, which is my, a paste bin that I've put up. You can copy those or you could pause and I'll show you, we'll do the whole OSD preset. But at the very least, you're gonna copy these two lines, set OSD canvas width and set OSD canvas height. We're gonna to go to the CLI and we're gonna paste those lines in and type the word save. And that will correctly set the size of the OSD for the uh, device. But you'll notice if you look down at the bottom of the screen, I had my OSD set up for walk snail, which had a different canvas size, and notice that some of my OSD elements down here at the bottom of the screen are going off the edge. So uh, in order to get a full and complete OSD setup, there are two things you could do. One is you could go around and you could manually turn on and off individual elements, and you can click and drag them around on screen and put them anywhere you like. And when you do that, you'll see that those changes that you make on screen are reflected in the goggles. As you move the elements around in Betaflight Configurator, you can put them wherever you want on screen. But what I'm gonna do, so I don't set this up manually each time, I just load a preset that I have created and you're welcome to do the same. So this is my HD0 OSD preset and what you can do is you can go to this link in the video description below and copy, you can just hit copy raw to clipboard right there. And then in Betaflight Configurator, we go to the CLI Go to the text box, paste that in, hit enter, and then type the word save, and your OSD will look just like mine. And you could tweak it as you see fit. That will also, by the way, set the canvas lines correctly. Now your HD0 system is fully functional, but we're not done yet. You still need to know how to configure some of the basic options of the system, such as the output power, the channel, and so forth. And I wanna show you how to do that. We're gonna press the sticks down and in, and that will give us access to the HD0 configuration menu that you see here on my screen. From that menu, you can change the channel of the HD0 video transmitter. You can change its output power, uh, and you can see we can now go 25, 500, all the way to max. 
you're going to want to run at max power most of the time, unless you're flying with other friends and you want to avoid interfering with them, then you might decide to turn the power down. The other time you might want to turn the power down is if you're using the video transmitter on the bench like I am and you want to prevent it from overheating. Although as you can see and probably here, I've still got a little fan blowing on it because it'll still overheat even at lower output power. Um, as far as channel goes, that's also going to be relevant for when you are flying with other people and you want to avoid interfering with them. Rather than go deep into that topic, I'm going to put a link in the video description below to a video about best practices for flying with other people. For the time being, I'm going to set it to channel race eight. That is the highest frequency that the video transmitter is capable of using. And the reason I use that is because it avoids interference from Wi-Fi devices. Wi-Fi doesn't go that high. Uh, the output power of the video transmitter is slightly lower on channel eight than on channel one. So if you're in an area where you know there's no Wi-Fi, you would want to go down to channel one and get the most output power. But for me, I know I have Wi-Fi at my house, quite a lot of it actually. We're going to stick to channel race eight. Um, low power mode, off or on, causes the video transmitter to be in a lower output power when you are disarmed and then go to full output power when you're armed. This helps prevent it from overheating, but it does mean that if you crash or land out in a field and disarm, it will immediately go to low power and you may lose video. I tend to run with this off, but that's really up to you. There's also a uh, first as an option, which means it'll be in low power mode until the very first time you arm, then it'll stay at full power mode uh, until, until you power cycle. That actually might be smarter. Maybe I'll try that. So I'm gonna go ahead and hit save and exit to commit these changes and I will immediately lose video because I've changed what channel the video transmitter's on. I can just roll this button to change to channel race eight, which is where I know that the video transmitter has gone. And now we are back. The other menu that I wanna show you is accessed by centering the throttle and then pushing right on the yaw stick. There we go. This is the camera menu and it allows you to change the camera settings like brightness, contrast, saturation, and so forth. That's all well and good, but most people are gonna fly those on the default. The main setting that you might want to change, oh, horizontal vertical flip. I installed my camera upside down, but wait. Come on, baby, horizontal vertical flip. Will this save me? Hold on, save and exit. I probably need to power cycle. <gasps> it did, it fixed it. Did it also flip the vertical? Wait, I can't tell. I think it did. I think, it, oh, I didn't have to take the camera out and turn it over. Well, that's good. That's worth knowing. Let's get back in that menu. Okay. The main parameter that most people are going to want to change is the video mode. And uh, HD0 is capable of supporting many different video modes. 540p90 is the lowest latency, but also the lowest resolution. We can choose 960 by 720 at 60 FPS, which is the standard mode, a good balance between resolution, range, and latency. There's also 540p60, which is low resolution and medium latency, but increased range. And there should be a 1080p option. Maybe this camera doesn't support it, but HD0 does. That's weird. I don't know why they aren't uh, doing that. Let's go to uh, 720p60. Save and exit. I said earlier that this 90 FPS run cam camera could do all of the video modes that HD0 supports. I was wrong about that. It does not do the 1080p 30 mode. It does all of the others. Now you know everything that you need to know in order to use HD0 with this build and you're ready to go on and finish the build. Remember before you go fly to set the output power to max, don't go fly at 25 milliwatts. You need all the range and penetration you can get. I am so happy to be able to include HD0 in this playlist. I was sad to leave it out, but it just didn't fit in the frame. And now that it does, I'm, I'm thrilled for HD0 and for, for you guys who fly HD0 to be able to participate in this project when you couldn't before. I'm going to put a card on screen to the full playlist that you're going to continue finishing this build, hopefully, as well as a link in the video description below to if you can't see the card for some reason. I'll see you there.